Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Library in Paris's virtual evenings with an author program. I'm Catherine Olin, programs manager at the American Library. For those of you who don't know us, um, we're the largest English language lending library on the continent. So that's something we're very proud of. Um, but not only do we have, you know, books, periodicals, all sorts of resources, both on site and digital, but we're also a very vibrant cultural center and event space. Um, for the moment, we're, of course, a Zoom event space, but we hope to be welcoming you back sometime in 2021. And of course, we've had pretty good news about a vaccine in the last, uh, I think, since we've last gathered. So that's wonderful. Um, another thing to know about the American Library is we're independent. We are uh, a nonprofit, so we're not accepting government funding from either the US or the French governments, and we rely on the, you know, the support of our donors and our community a great deal. So thank you to any of you in the audience who are supporters, members, or just a part of this wonderful community. Um, we're also 100 years old, so we celebrated our centennial this year in confinement, which was quite an adventure. We had a, a virtual gala. Some of you may have been there back in October. It was a, a really nice, successful event, despite not being able to, to get together as we do every year. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about us, I recommend that you, you, know, you visit our homepage. Many of you may have done that in order to find this event. You can also follow us on social media. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that type of thing, whatever you're on. Um, and we also have our, our events uh, from, the, from the virtual evenings with an author, those are posted to YouTube. So if you're wanting to check out anything that's happened in the past few months, you can go ahead and sort of look through our library there. Um, so tonight, we're very delighted to be hosting Francois Xavier Fauvel. He received his PhD from the University of Paris 1, Panthéon Sorbonne, where he specialized in the history of Africa. Since 2002, he has been affiliated with the CNRS and the Institute for African Studies in Aix-en-Provence. He spent time as a researcher in the US, Ethiopia, and South Africa. Since returning to France in 2009, he joined a, a research team, TRAS, at the University of Toulouse de Jean Jaurès. And with some of his colleagues, he created Le Pôle Afrique, a research initiative bringing together archeologists specializing in Africa and doctoral students some originating from Africa, who are pursuing, pursuing doctoral research in the field. He has been professor at the Collège de France since 2019. And he is here with us and he also has a PowerPoint presentation, I believe. So I will go ahead and hand it over. And thank you so much for being here, Francois Xavier. Thank you very much, um, Catherine. Let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, I think once, yep, perfect. Okay. So first, thank you very much for the, to the American Library in Paris for inviting me and thank you very much to you, Catherine, for being the organizer and host of this, um, of this talk. Thank you to all of you for attending um, this talk from your, from your place or your confinement place and given the pandemic uh, situation. I'm gonna talk about my book, The Golden um, uh, Rhinoceros, Histories of the African Middle Ages, which was published uh, in English uh, by Princeton University Press two, two years ago in 2018, uh, and um, based on a translation from the French that was initially published in 2013. I would like to thank um, Princeton University Press for, for, doing a, for, for making a wonderful uh, book um, especially the design um, uh, I've, 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 uh, I've extracted from the, from the book, uh, the, the, the front pages of several chapters, each of them being adorned with an um, with engraving-like drawing based on real um, uh, document, whether um, uh, uh, coins or, or paintings or archaeological um, uh, data. And I would like to thank my translator, Troy Tice, whom I know is attending this um, this um, this talk, he made a he made a very sensible uh, translation of my um, uh, of my book, and I thank him uh, very much. First, I would like to uh, show you a few written document. Um, you may not be familiar with um, with uh, with them, but uh, uh, as you know, many people still believe today that that um, that there are no written documents uh, in. Um, in Africa or about Africa, and that being a historian of, um, uh, of Africa consists mainly 
in in um, in in recording oral tradition or in doing um, uh, um, excav field excavations. It is not true, actually. And um, uh, the main document on which we are working are written documents. And uh, in 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 most cases, written documents written outside um, uh, African um, uh, African uh, countries. And I just want to show you a few a few examples. On the on your left hand side, on the left side of the of the screen, you have an Arabic uh, document, and um, it exemplifies the the the, the fact that um, in most cases we have Arabic description of Africa by geographers most of whom never traveled to Africa, but were able to uh, record um, uh, or interview people who had uh, traveled, whether they were diplomats or merchants or whatever. And, um, and we are lucky Sorry, to I'm have a number of uh, wonderful- Xavier, do you, yep. do you hear me? I'm gonna have to turn off your video, I think, that may improve the audio. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you again with your connection, so. I'll just, uh, I'll stop your video if that's all right. And we can still see your screen. Sure, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so, the, the, so, so, so mostly we have um, these um, Arab, Arabic geographers who, um, who wrote descriptions about, um, about Africa. On the left, the, the, so the left document um, is the first page of the description of Ghana Ghana in Arabic, and, uh, Ghana by um, uh, Andalus, Andalusian Arab geographer Al Bakri in the mid 11th century. And um, he is one of the most wonderful sources that we have to, uh, to uh, retrace African history in this, um, uh, in this period. But obviously, we have a number of other Arab uh, geographers uh, who um, described. Africa. We have also a number of travelers, real travelers. And for instance, Ibn Battuta, that whom you may know, at least by name, he was a famous traveler in the 14th century, and he traveled from his uh, homeland in Morocco um, to India, uh, and uh, from southern Russia to, um, to, uh, to Somalia. And he left a description uh, which is actually available in English, um, a description of the world, um, which, which means travel, basically. And, um, and is one of the very rare instances when we have a first-hand description of, of, um, uh, of, um, of countries in Africa. The second uh, document, the one in the middle, is even stranger. Uh, as you may, as some of you may recognize, it's written with Hebrew characters, but it's not written in Hebrew, it's written in Arabic. It's what it's called, what is called actually Judeo-Arabic. Um, so Arabic language written with a Hebrew script. And um, uh, again, um, we are very lucky uh, to, um, uh, to, um, to, 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 to know of a place that was discovered uh, at the end uh, of, the, of the 19th century in Cairo, in the attic of the old Jewish synagogue of Cairo, um, uh, which yielded uh, literally dozens of thousands of such documents dating from between the 10th and the 13th century, mostly. And, um, and um, uh, so all these documents were produced by members of the uh, uh, Cairo um, uh, Jewish communities, but and some of them are legal documents about marriage or divorce or adoption or whatever. Some of them are diplomatic um, documents. Some are commercial documents. For instance, you know, a, a merchant, a Jewish, a Jewish merchant, coming from the West, from Morocco, or coming back from India, for instance, and this is the selling agreement. Nope, all these kind of things. In that case, it is a letter that was written around 1000 um, by someone in, um, in, um, in Tunisia, in today's Tunisia, um, uh, sending, and that, it is a letter that was sent to um, a relative in Cairo informing him that the caravan from Sigil Massa in Morocco was was coming and was soon to arrive um, in um, uh, in Cairo. And obviously, this caravan from Sigil Massa was itself coming from across the Sahara, from 
from what was then the kingdom of Ghana. On the right hand side, you have another document which is in Chinese. And it's a stele engraved in Chinese and uh, that was found in China. It was engraved um, uh, around the first third of the 15th century by the famous um, Ming Dynasty's admiral Zheng He, uh, who was commissioned by the Ming Emperor to do um, to travel um, uh, in the uh, South China Sea and Western Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean. And in two occasions, uh, he landed, Zheng He's fleet landed in, um, uh, on African shores, uh, namely in uh, Somalia. And so we have interesting details about um, uh, two Somalia place um, in this um, inscription. We also uh, have a number of written documents that were produced in Africa by African societies. And uh, you may already be aware of the fact that, for instance, in Ethiopia, um, uh, uh, Christianity was deeply rooted from the fourth century. And there, um, um, a society, a Christian society and a Christian kingdom developed uh, continuously up to the present um, um, and um, left a number of uh, wonderful documents, whether um, archaeological, like the uh, architectural uh, complex of Lalibela that you can see on your uh, bottom right um, uh, screen, which is a complex of rock-hewn churches, so literally sculpted churches, not built, sculpted churches in the, in the bedrock. Um, a fascinating site of which I'm talking in my, um, uh, in my book, but you also, have, you also have other hundreds of churches and monasteries, uh, sometimes at very high altitude, like on your left, bottom left um, uh, picture, where you can maybe see the tiny round church on the top of this peak here, and, um, and where monks um, uh, live. And this uh, Christian society um, of Ethiopia produced a number of um, um, produced texts um, uh, and uh, left dozens of thousands of manuscripts written in um, the Ethiopian script and in uh, an Ethiopian language, uh, namely Gez. In that case, for instance, the, in, on, the, on the manuscript you can see it's uh, written in Gez, but with some addition in uh, Coptic and in Arabic. However, um, in many cases, we also have to use material um, uh, uh, document. Uh, and uh, to uh, go directly to uh, the one that gives its name to the title of my book, to the Golden Rhinoceros, it comes from a place uh, in today's South Africa, the extreme north of today's South Africa, um, uh, on the Limpopo River that, that makes the border with, um, uh, with Zimbabwe. Um, uh, and there, there is a site that was um, that, that is called Mapungubwe, that was discovered in the 1930s by white settlers um, uh, of South Africa. Uh, on the top of this hill that you see, uh, whose name is Mapungubwe, that means the uh, the, the jackal um, uh, hill. And on top of this hill, they discovered. They, they, they dug and they, and they looted basically the, the, the place and they discovered not only this tiny golden rhinoceros, but also a number of other uh, golden figurines and, um, and, skeleton, and, and bones, human bones. So obviously there were graves there. And uh, they discovered a number of, of pots, etc. Uh, it is interesting because um, it, is, uh, it exemplifies uh, um, 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 uh, the, the, how we know what we know about the African past in many, in many instances, in the sense that um, uh, many things were found during the colonial period by either 
uh, private individuals or by colonial administrators. Um, uh, and uh, in many cases, objects um, uh, found their way to um, Western um, uh, museums and, um, and institutions. And to say the least, um, these were not always excavated professionally and, uh, and, um, uh, and were first um, uh, looted. Uh, so that was the case with uh, Mapungubwe. But after a few weeks, one of the uh, white settlers that had found this site um, uh, called his former history professor in Pretoria, and he was a famous um, history and archaeological and um, archaeologist um, uh, who bought the farm for the South African state and who started professional excavation. And this is when professional archaeologists discovered and understood that there were graves that were eventually dated to the 12th and 13th century. Here, not only golden earthings, but also um, these kind of shells that you may recognize, they are called uh, quarry shells, and also uh, thousands of gold beads and this kind of tiny, minute glass, um, uh, glass beads. And also this shard here, this green glazed shard, of a kind of ceramic that any archaeologist can immediately recognize as uh, having, made, having, having been made in China. It is called the Celadon and it was made in China. So it is very interesting that in, in this tiny place in uh, South Africa, uh, we find a number of imported um, uh, objects, including uh, being imported from China. Let me show you another example of such um, archaeological sites. Now we are in Ethiopia on the black uh, dot on the map um, uh, here. And again, we have a grave um, uh, that we can qualify in tradition and in just because, as you can see, there were many people buried in the same place. I mean, each tiny yellow circle is a skull, okay? And so this kind of collective burial cannot be um, uh, a Muslim or Christian um, uh, burial. Plus, all these people were buried with things, with their own um, uh, arms or jewels or, um, or whatever, or pots, um, uh, etc. And again, this site, and and, and together with other dozens of similar sites belonging to what is called the Shai culture, which again uh, is completely coeval, I mean, 10th to 13th century with uh, Mapungubwe, yielded a number of beads, again, glass beads of different colors and stone, carnelian stone beads, and, uh, and, uh, which were again imported from far away. And let me give you a third example, which again I mentioned and I deal with in my in my book. That now we are in uh, Eastern Mauritania. Uh, the site is called Madani Jafen. It's literally a car caravan wreck. Um, it was discovered in the 1960s by famous French naturalist, cum archaeologist Theodore Monod, who was informed by Mauritanian uh, uh, hunters that they had found something uh, in the Sahara. So he organized an expedition. And after weeks of travel on uh, camels, he found this tiny place, not much larger than a human body you know, lying in the middle of thousands of sand dunes all alike. Okay? And um, I mention it because um, uh, uh, this site was seen by Theodore Monod, was described by Theodore Monod, who spent there just a few hours he took four pictures, he made a number of drawings, he made a small, very tiny um, uh, excavation, he collected a number of shells and collected a number of, uh, of um, uh, copper bars, he made measurements, etc. and then he left because he had to travel another few weeks. And that was the last time this site was seen. So again, it's very interesting. It, il it, il it illuminates the condition that um, um, we are facing many times in, um, um, in Africa when we are uh, doing um, uh, research, the difficulty to reach um, uh, the field and um, the condition of the findings in the, on the ground. So in that case, again, this site delivered a number of curry shells. Interestingly, all the uh, artifacts that I mentioned 
are uh, involved artifacts. Obviously, they are not the only ones that we found in that we find in this kind of graves or or wreck uh, in the desert. But they are uh, the, 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 they are among the more interesting because they allow to map the uh, origins of the artifacts and sometimes to date them. So when we map the artifacts I just mentioned, whether they are glass beads and, uh, or quarry shells or carnelian beads or, 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 or porcelain, um, um, uh, it is interesting that it maps the, the entire um, uh, 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 commercial basin of the Islamic world, of, of the Eastern uh, Islamic world. And the, the Maldives, for instance, were collected and, and, and in, the, in the Maldives archipelago, the carnelian beads were produced in northwestern India and Pakistan. Um, uh, uh, porcelain was produced in China and exclusively in China until the modern period. And these glass beads were produced in a number of workshops that um, um, uh, scholars um, are able to map and which stretch from Eastern India to Vietnam and to Sumatra. So how did these artifacts arrive in, um, in Africa? Uh, it is true that in a few instances, like the Zheng He's uh, Ming Admiral, uh, whom I mentioned um, uh, at first, Chinese um, uh, traveled. It is also true that in, in a few instances, um, African um, uh, uh, traveled to um, uh, other places, uh, if only because there were Christians or Muslim pilgrims, and to, so they had an opportunity to travel in the other in the other parts of the world. But uh, in most cases, um, it is thanks to the mediation of the of the Islamic world that these objects traveled to um, um, uh, to uh, Africa. And um, the, one of the characteristics of the, of, the, of the Middle Ages period is the existence of the Islamic world, which was a, a, a unified, uh, ideologically unified, um, uh, if not politically, um, religiously unified and commercially unified world that eased circulation of people and things um, across the old world. And, um, uh, and thanks to uh, this uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon, uh, travelers and pilgrims and merchants and diplomats were able to, um, uh, to, uh, to uh, go quicker and in, into different directions, including across the Sahara and across the Indian Ocean to the, uh, to the, to the Sahel region, to the, to the Middle Nile region, to, or to the um, East African um, the coast. This section that I just developed based on the Google Earth map uh, was not a strange one in the Middle Ages. And for instance, look at this map that was drawn by um, uh, Arab geographer Al Idrisi uh, in the 12th century. It is also a circular um, uh, map. Um, uh, you may not be completely familiar with, with it because the north is basically at the bottom, you know, and the south is at the top of the map, but you are able uh, to um, uh, see where Europe was. Okay, Europe was here, Asia was here, and Africa was here. So basically this here in the middle is the Mediterranean Sea, okay? And uh, Africa, as you may notice, has a very strange shape, you know, a crescent like um, uh, shape. It's, a bit, it's because of a number of geographical reasons for the, due to, uh, 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 because of the, of the history of, of, uh, um, of geography, um, uh, of Arab geography that was borrowed to the Greek um, uh, geographers. But an interesting implication of this very strange shape of Africa is that um, uh, the southern tip of Africa is literally in front of the easternmost tip of Asia, that is China. And that makes it very interesting that, you know, South Africa and China, South Africa, where we find Chinese porcelain, you know, are, face to, are facing each other exactly like, you know, Morocco is facing Italy in the Mediterranean Sea. So that's a very interesting conception of the world, which, if not in, 
entirely accurate in terms of our concept of geography, was at least very accurate in terms of the, in, of the commercial implication um, of, this, um, of this world. So thanks, thanks to this um, interconnection between um, uh, Africa and the rest of the world, and this interconnection uh, permitted by um, the, the, the global Islamic world, we know of a number of polities that developed in different regions of Africa. You may have heard of the most famous of them, including Ghana, that was not in, today, in today's Ghana, okay? Ghana, the, the, the medieval Ghana was here on the southern shore of the, of the Sahara in what is today southern Mauritania. Uh, you probably have heard of Mali, of Gao, which was an independent kingdom in the Middle Ages. You may have heard, I, I just talked of the Christian kingdom of Abyssinia. You've heard of Mogadishu, but maybe not as a famous um, city-state of, of the uh, Mid Middle Ages. And you probably heard of Great Zimbabwe, which was in today's um, um, uh, Zimbabwe. And you may not have heard of less well-known um, uh, African polities such as Kanem, for instance, which was a, a very powerful kingdom on the northeastern shore of, of Lake Chad, of the Christian kingdoms of Nubia. Um, uh, Nubia is the portion of the Nile River that was south of Aswan, south of Egypt, um, along the middle um, Nile uh, river. You may not have already heard of the Islamic kingdoms of Abyssinia, that, that we are neighbor to the Christian kingdom. And you may not have heard of Kilua or Sofala, which are also very powerful city-states along the, um, uh, uh, the, the coast, um, the East African coast. All these I mentioned in, all these and others I mentioned in, um, uh, in the book. Another type of document, um, uh, which is also very um, uh, interesting and um, very important to retrace African history, are maps. I already showed you a map by Arab geographers. In that case here, you can see a wonderful and very famous map, which is called the Catalan Atlas. It is preserved today at the uh, uh, French National Library because it was uh, 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 given, offered to the French, to the then French king at the end of the 14th century by a Spanish king who had had it commissioned to Jewish cartographers and, uh, who were based uh, in the Balearic uh, Island, um, the then most famous cartographic school uh, was um, uh, a school by these Jewish cartographers, Abraham Kresk and his son, who were um, in um, Mallorca, in the Balearic um, uh, Island. I just show you here on the screen a detail of the southern portion of, of one of the map um, uh, that comprise uh, this um, uh, atlas. And you can see here a king sitting on a throne. He basically wear a golden kaftan and it is sit on a golden throne. And uh, he has on the head, on his head, a um, crown, a golden crown, and he carries in his hand a golden scepter. Not that crown and scepter really belonged to um, the, um, the royal regalia of the, of the king of this region. Rather, they belong to the French kingdom. But since the atlas was designed to be offered to the French kingdom, that was a nice way to indicate to the French recipient of the gift that he had a powerful counterpart on the southern part um, of, the, uh, of the world. And interestingly, as you can see, for the for reason that I'm going to highlight uh, very soon, this man carries a very heavy gold nugget uh, in, his, um, in his hand. Let me superimpose on this map where the Sahara 
um, uh, was. And uh, if you um, and if you know that the Sahara is uh, uh, represents two thousand kilometers wide, sixty days on a camel, and um, uh, you get an idea of the very huge distance that is represented on this map. Okay, the sea is on the top. Here are the mountain of um, North Africa. You know the Atlas Mountain of North Africa. Here at Sigil Massa, which is um, uh, um, uh, which I uh, transcribed um, here, here in Sigil Massa, you are in two days the uh, south southern Morocco. Okay, and this is the Sahara. And then you see on the map a number of places that are written. Ten book here, which obviously is Timbuktu, or Gogo -Go here, which obviously is Gao, or here Ciutat de Mali in Catalan. Okay, it's written in Catalan, which um, uh, which means uh, Mali city or city of Mali. Let me zoom again on this text on the on the legend here which is written in Catalan and which refers to the king here. I transcribed Catalan for you here and I translated into English uh, here. This black lord is called Musemeli, lord of the blacks of Guinea. This king is the richest and most noble lord of the whole region because of the abundance of gold that is collected in his land. It is very interesting. Um, uh, because it's true, <laughs> because um, uh, it is known that um, uh, most of the gold that was struck in the Islamic world and transformed into gold coins, the famous dinar of the Islamic world, and that uh, circulated in the rest of the Mediterranean uh, world, uh, came from um, uh, Africa, from two regions in Africa, mostly from West and, uh, Africa, and um, uh, and so uh, and 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 it is thanks to the, his ability to export huge amounts of gold that the king of Mali in the 14th century, mostly in the 14th century, uh, were able to uh, attain a sort of fame and a power in the um, uh, in the Islamic um, uh, in the Islamic world. Let me give you an example now on, of two texts, uh, and that will uh, uh, serve me to illustrate uh, the character of African history, of, of, what it, of, of what it means to be a historian of, um, of Africa, namely the fragmentary nature of the documentation. We, are, we don't know much about the kingdom of Ghana that was more or less in the same region as Mali, but, but three centuries earlier than Mali, you know, between the, the 10th and the 13th um, um, uh, century. We don't know much. Uh, not many uh, um, uh, travelers left, this, no traveler left description, not many geographers um, uh, left description of Ghana. And we have no internal sources um, uh, from uh, this. Um, uh, from this um, uh, kingdom. We, what if, almost everything we know about ancient Ghana is based on two geographers, Al-Bakri in the mid 11th century, whom I already mentioned, and Al-Idrisi, the famous uh, geographer and cartographer who drew this map, um, whom I also already mentioned in the mid 12th century. So two windows, okay? One century apart, two windows on Ghana, and that's it. We are fortunate that these two windows are wide enough, okay? And um, Al Bakri um, uh, devotes several pages to the kingdom of Ghana, and uh, the same for uh, Al Idrisi. And the difference between the two are very, um, uh, bit, are, are very interesting. Basically, what Al Bakri says, based on the text here, um, was that the city of Ghana consists of two towns situated in a plain. And it goes on to say that one of these towns is the town for the foreign merchants, the Muslim merchants that, who came from the Maghrib or for Egypt. And the other one is the royal town for the local people and for the, and for the local king. And so we understand that the foreign merchants are under the dependency of the local African uh, king whom, it is also very interesting, was then a pagan, a non-Muslim, non-Christian um, uh, king. And uh, Al-Idrisi devotes pages and pages describing 
the pagan uh, uh, faith and the pagan cult and the pagan um, uh, uh, grave uh, 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 burial, um, uh, um, etc. Now, uh, a century later, we have less than a century later, we have this description by um, by. Sorry, I need to remove this by um, uh, Al Idrisi, and um, and now um, uh, um, uh, we learn from um, Al Idrisi that the people have turned Muslim, and that the king is um, 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 a Muslim, and he says that the khutbah in the sermon, the Muslim sermon is delivered in the name of the king. So we understand from um, uh, Al-Idrisi that um, uh, the entire uh, dynasty has, 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 has become um, uh, Muslim. But then he adds also, Ghana consists of two towns on both banks of the river. The king has a palace on the bank of the, of the Nile, which means the river. The people, the people of Ghana have strongly made boats on the Nile which they use for fishing or for moving about between uh, the two uh, towns. What do we do with this? Well, that's where the problem starts because uh, archaeologists and historians concur and agree that, sorry, that the site corresponding to um, the one described by Alakri will be this one that you see on the picture. It is an aerial infrared picture where you can see, or you may not see, but you have to believe me. I surrounded it with a dotted line. It is a huge urban site dating to the uh, 11th to 13th century. And for many reasons, um, 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 implying the calculation of distance and, in, and, and, the, and, and the description of mosque, etc. There are very good reasons to believe that this one is the site corresponding to uh, the foreign quarter uh, of, the, uh, of the city um, described by Al-Bakri in the mid 11th century, that is when the uh, king of Ghana was still a pagan uh, king. But this site is found in southern Mauritania in a region uh, where for sure no river ever, where, where no river ever flowed. And, um, um, uh, and so that's, that's a problem. And, um, uh, and how can we reconcile the description by Al-Bakri and the description by Al-Idrisi saying that the city is on both banks of the river and this archaeological site. Well, it is, it is a typical case of conflict between data of different nature and of different um, uh, period. Most of the time, uh, specialists consider that Idrisi may have been wrong when he described the city of the, the capital city of Ghana on both banks of, um, of a river. The problem is that Idrisi gives many details and many convincing details. It's not just, you know, it's not just in passing. He gives many details about the both bank of bo about both banks of, of the of the river and the location of the palace of the king, etc. Plus, should we not believe Idrisi um, when he says that the capital city is on both banks of the river? Why should we believe him when he says that the dynasty had converted to Islam? And so how do we choose what we believe and what we don't believe about um, uh, um, uh, Idrisi or Al-Bakri uh, testimony? For my part, what I think is that both writers were right and that this archaeological site correspond to the one described by Al-Bakri. But the implication of what I believe is that, well, we are still missing one city. And there is another one, the second capital of Ghana, which is still to be found somewhere. It is not an isolated case because the capital city of Mali, which I mentioned earlier and which is located in the Catalan Atlas is also missing. And for sure, it must have been a major site during the 14th century with a major uh, foreign settlement with a palace, with a big mosque and, and uh, with, um, uh, with a Muslim quarter um, uh, with Muslim graves, etc., but it's still missing on the ground, and we still don't know 
where it is. Let me just provide you with a few uh, takeaways because I'm ending uh, this talk right on, right on time with a few um, uh, takeaways. First, fragments. As you may have understood, um, our documentation as uh, historians or archaeologists uh, of Africa is for the most part fragmentary. Whether it is um, um, isolated written description of polities, of societies, of cities, whether it is uh, objects of, or, or sites that have been destroyed or looted, etc. These can be considered as fragments of the whole truth. For some people, uh, that would mean less documentation equal less history. For me, it is not the case at all. I mean, all these regions of Africa, exactly like all the rest of the uh, societies on Earth, have the same history, the same depth of um, history. Um, it, it is only true that the incomplete evidence that we have um, uh, 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 represent a challenge and a, a challenge to, to try to restitute the past in unconventional ways. And in the case I followed in, the golden, in, in my book, The Golden Rhinoceros, I tried to develop a technique um, which I compared to stained glass, um, uh, 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 which in the sense that what I find interesting with stained glass is that you have these tiny glass fragments through which light comes, okay? But you also have the lead um, a joint between the between the 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 the, the, the fragments of um, of of uh, of glass, and what is interesting is that you see this lead, and you see this lead as what separate fragments, but also what join these um, uh, these fragments. It is what I tried to do in the garden by showing what we don't know too, and uh, it is in my. Uh, and, uh, in, in my, my, my feeling is that it is the only way to be fully honest with um, uh, the documents and with the readers to not to conceal the fact that we don't know everything, but to, sh but to show them that uh, in some cases we just don't know, but that the question we can ask or the, scenario, or, or the several scenarios that we can um, uh, write are more interesting than the story um, itself. Another point is, uh, well, so much remains to be discovered. I mentioned the capital of Mali, of Ghana. I mentioned the capital of Mali. I could mention dozens of other major cities whose name is found, can be found uh, in, the, in the text and that we don't know where they are. I myself discovered, together with colleagues in Ethiopia, uh, once famous capital, Muslim capital city, of the Ifat kingdom, the, the, the most famous uh, mass, uh, Islam, uh, Islamic uh, kingdom in Ethiopia in the 14th century. And so, um, uh, and so I know that there are very good reasons to be optimistic about what we're gonna find in the, in the, in the future. And at the same time, it's also a good reason to be humble. Why is it so? Because, you know, most historian specialists of other regions of the globe write on the basis of the entire documentation, which in many cases is just full, it's just complete. And um, in, in our case, uh, for historians of Africa, we write under the sovereignty of facts that have not yet been fully established and that will be established in the future, at some point in the future. So, you can just write anything. I mean, you, you, you have to be even more careful than any other um, uh, the historian uh, because these facts not yet um, established do not allow you to uh, do exactly what you want. And so this is a, this is a lesson, I think, of optimism and humility that, um, is, um, uh, that, that, uh, that every historian uh, should remember, not only historians of, about, uh, of, of, um, of Africa. And the final, my final takeaway is who's Middle Ages? And um, some people um, uh, contend that um, uh, the word uh, Middle Ages should apply only to Europe. 
and um, I don't see why, and I disagree. And um, uh, it is not because a, a word was in, was invented by some people in the 16th or 15th or 16th century in a in a tiny quarter of the of the world that we historian and reader today should prevent ourselves to use it in a different way and to reshape it and to resize it. And uh, furthermore, I think that the more we explore the way how Africa and uh, African societies in different parts of Africa and African polities and African individuals were interconnected with uh, other regions of the globe, the more we understand differently, uh, more fully, more globally, um, the, um, um, uh, the Middle Ages, and the more we are able to redefine a Middle Ages um, differently, or in other words, a Middle Ages that is made of many different provinces and not just, um, and not just um, uh, one. I'm done, and I thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll see if I can turn back your video on here. Maybe the connection has improved. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Francois Xavier. And we already do have questions coming in, um, so that's fantastic. Uh, also, feel free to submit yours if you're still thinking. Um, we'll we'll get to as many as we have time for. All right. So the first one um, came when you were showing one of uh, one of the maps early on, and it's from Charlie, who's asking um, the map of Asia, Europe, Africa shows commercial relationships, but is not geographically correct. Were there navigational maps with, which had a more realistic representation? Do you have evidence of those? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Actually, this map is um, what we call a cosmographic representation of the um, of the world, and it is true that it is not the only kind of map that we are produced in the Arab uh, world um, or in the European world, no, but mostly in the Arab world um, in the um, uh, in the Middle Ages. And for instance, Idrisi Al Idrisi himself produced this cosmographic map of the entire Ecumen or Old World, if you prefer. But he also produced an entire atlas, which is a complete completely differently um, organized and uh, organized in a very modern way you know, like the rectangles you know of um, uh, of um, uh, longitudes and and um, uh, and latitudes and um, uh, so yes in that sense they were more um, uh, accurate uh, although we might say uh, today that it was still geographically speaking inaccurate okay but my only point on the on the map uh, that I wanted to emphasize is the fact that um, despite its evident distortion and inaccuracy, what was interesting was were, were the implication of the maps. It is, I find it very interesting to represent the Indian Ocean as a closed sea, exactly as a, as a symmetric you know, with, um, with the Mediterranean Sea, with the implication that basically Africa and China were just the same world. And I find it very, um, I find it very illustrative. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is also from Charlie, who is wondering if you have any theories as to why these former major capital cities have disappeared and their locations forgotten. Yeah, that's very interesting and very complicated question. Uh, Charlie, if you if you understand French, I would recommend that you follow my lecture at the Collège de France. Um, uh, I devoted last year entire uh, uh, course um, and this one, and, and I will give it, uh, devote this one too, I mean the coming one too, uh, to this question. And um, uh, basically, how can entire cities disappear? Um, well, they do not entirely disappear. The answer is that they do not. Um, uh, they are forgotten or we are uh, looking at the wrong place. And, um, and, um, uh, and, 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 uh, but whatever the reasons, I mean, it is it is interesting. Why are we looking in the wrong direction? And um, and the answer is very complicated. And it's partly because um, uh, uh, I think, and I have a theory on this. Uh, I think that uh, African rulers uh, tended to uh, use um, uh, uh, ecological threshold. In other words, very 
difficult environment to settle their capital because that allowed them to um, uh, to to behave as interface between their own world and the rest of the world. Take for instance southern Mauritania. Southern Mauritania is a desert, eh? and it's probably the one of the uh, arid, mo the most arid region of the desert. It's just bare, you know, um, uh, uh, dunes. And it is there that you find this wonderful site whose name was uh, Kumbisali in southern Mauritania that was once the capital of, of, um, uh, of Kenya. So why set your capital there if, there is no, if no agriculture is possible ar uh, around it? If you have no village around it, what is the point of having a capital in such a region, uh, 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 honestly? And, um, and it is not the way how... Um, uh, 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 Christian European rulers did. I mean, they tended to they tended to put their to, to place their capital in densely populated and densely cultivated uh, regions. Obviously, that was not the case in many regions of um, um, of um, of Africa. I think the reason is that by putting your capital in, in, uh, on the southern edge of the Sahara, you made it possible for this capital to be the the, the the choke point, you know, between two um, uh, two wide network of of merchants, okay. and uh, for instance, the Berber Arab Trans-Saharan network and the West African um, uh, commercial um, uh, network. So that was a way to exploit very difficult environment in order to be able to be an interface or a choke point between. Um, the commercial um, network. That may explain why we are not looking in this uh, region, bec because we tend to, you know, to be focused on irrigated, cultivated, densely popul populated plains. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead to the next question, which is from Maureen. Um, she's wondering if you can speak to any field work that's still ongoing where, you know, you're getting more information. Um, I think you can run with that and talk about any region you would like. Um, and then she's also curious about whether there's any collaboration with African archaeologists or universities at these sites. Sure, sure. of course, of course there is. Um, I, 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 hardly, I, I hardly mentioned any um, of my colleagues uh, during, this, um, uh, during this talk, but um, I've mentioned all of them um, in the, and all the relevant authors um, in the in the in the end notes of each of my chapters in the in the uh, in the book, but yes, there are many um, uh, field work um, taking place um, in Africa, in different regions of, of Africa, um, uh, and by many teams, you know, by many international teams or African teams, um, um, uh, etc. So um, and um, uh, and. Uh, and let me well, yeah, yes, just a few just a few examples. I know of several I know of several teams that are currently working in Ethiopia and uh, on um, on on medieval sites. And there is a French Ethiopian team that works in Lalibela, for instance, um, uh, this rock hewn um, uh, site, um, the Christian site. Um, I want myself. Um, I started myself a new program in Tigray um, uh, that you may have heard of recently, um, um, on, a, on a new uh, medieval, newly discovered um, uh, Christian site. Um, I can mention also a British uh, Ethiopian team, by, uh, led by Timothy Insol, in um, who works on Islamic medieval sites in Ethiopia, and there are there are plenty actually, and um, there are plenty in. In, in Ethiopia, and there are plenty in other countries. In in some countries, however, it is it is very difficult today, and to uh, develop archaeological mission for geopolitical or security um, reasons. And I don't want to name these countries, but let's say that most of the upper third of Africa uh, today is uh, virtually forbidden for to 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 field and uh, research. Not that it is not possible for individual researchers to go there and to work, but you know, a historical archaeological team usually involves many people, up to you know, two dozen people, and cars and equipments, etc. So you are not you are not basically invisible in the landscape. Okay, so it's very. So if you want 
your people not to take any risk and it's just um, it's just impossible and um and um, in any case african governments and um your own government and my own government would not give me permission to uh, do research in these uh, countries Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I wanted to let everyone know that I did go ahead and drop the, the book order link, the purchase link into the chat box. So if you're interested, we have a special offer available through Princeton University Press um, where you can receive a 30% discount on the book. So go ahead and search in the chat if you'd like to find that. And then I do see another question from Linda. Um, so she's wondering if, if, the, sto if the book um, has a story or is it mostly facts and maps and that type of thing? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, there are stories. Actually, I'm, I, when I started write, to write this book, I wanted to write a book for two different audiences, a book for uh, researchers and who are not necessarily aware of what, is, of what is done in the other part of Africa, but also for a wider audience. It worked actually very well in the French, um, in the initial French version and in, in, and in another eight or ten other um, uh, European or not European actually, or in Chinese or Korean um, uh, language. And it worked also very well in, um, it's working also very well in, um, in English. And um, so it's, uh, it's for a wider, it's for, it's for an, an audience who doesn't know much initially about, um, about um, Africa. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically telling stories. And um, um, so uh, 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 coming from different, entrances or doors, doorways or windows. Sometimes I, I start by describing, you know, an archaeological site. Um, sometimes I, I, I try to, dis, I, I mention a map. Sometimes I, I mention an author or a traveler. And sometimes I tell the story of how a site was discovered. And sometimes I tell a story of an object that was found. Um, um, etc. So the the the, yeah, the book is full of is full of, of short stories actually you know between six and ten pages something like this, um, um, not complicated to to read and no um, uh, uh, and uh, no footnotes, just one long end note for those who want to learn more and for those who want to dig into the specialized you know, academic literature in different languages, etc. And so, so for those who want to know how I know what I know, they can read, you know, the, 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 the footnotes at the end of each, um, uh, at the end of each uh, chapter. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Francois Xavier, for your presentation, as well as your responses to these uh, wonderful audience questions. And um, that's all we'll have time for tonight in terms of questions. Um, but thank you again so much for being here. And I did also want to shout out again to Troy Tice, who is your translator, of course, and is a member of the American Library. It's a real pleasure to have you here in the audience, Troy. Um, and I'll close just by saying a couple of words about the library again and an upcoming event that I, that I wanted to highlight for everyone tonight. Um, so thank you again to the audience for joining us, for spending your evening with us. It's been wonderful. Um, many of you know, and you know, I said in the beginning that the American Library is a nonprofit. And traditionally, when we host uh, in-person events, we welcome donations of about 10 euros per person or whatever anybody feels they're able to give. Um, it's definitely not required. But if you're interested in supporting the library, I do recommend that you follow the link that I sent out in the email that was, uh, it was included with the Zoom link as well. And you can go and click and see, um, see what sorts of opportunities there are to support the library. We'd be very appreciative. Um, and as far as upcoming events, we have a very, very special one next month. So we'll be hosting Amor Tools, who's the author of A Gentleman in Moscow. It's a very, very popular book and we're just delighted to have him. He'll be in conversation with Mark Mayer. And that event is on uh, Wednesday, December 16. So you can go to our website or the programs calendar to, to check that out and see if you might be interested and go ahead and register just as you did for tonight's event. And there's also other, other wonderful events coming up as well. But again, thank you so much, Francois Xavier, for being here <laughs> and for everybody for sharing this evening with us. I wish you a wonderful night. Goodbye. <laughs> I see some of you clapping. That's fantastic. <laughs> Goodbye.